Start recording. Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game from scratch, live on Twitch, no engine, no libraries, just us in here writing every little last piece of code so that after this series is done, literally we have, we will have done every single piece um, of code that is necessary to run a game from top to bottom. No mysteries, leaving no stone unturned. That is, that is our mission. Our, our goal, our, our charge, if you will. Now, we are trying something here today that is new. I don't know if it's gonna work, we'll see. Uh, but basically, like, we have switched to Mischief for the Blackboard, um, and what I did is I went ahead and got the commercial version, and I'm trying starting a fresh Blackboard, and I'm just gonna save it to the directory and see if this works for people who can load it up um, uh, at home. The problem that I see with it is we were unable to figure out any way to really get this to work so that people could view it with a free viewer, and I still don't think that's going to be possible because I tried using the free version of Mischief, but the free version of Mischief doesn't even let you set a background color for the canvas, and so people were very sensitive to the colors. I remember when we first started it, they uh, people really wanted to have a dark background so that it would match uh, the editor that we use, so it wouldn't be kind of like very jarring when they switch between them. So I'm afraid we gotta go with the commercial one. The commercial one's only 25 bucks. So if people want to view the art file, they can choose to buy it. I don't know, it might load in the free version. We're not sure, but we're just gonna go with it as an experiment. We don't really have any, um, any other choice at this point. What I can do periodically to solve the sort of the problem is uh, to do some kind of an export uh, where I could save it out to um, an actual bitmap file eventually, but this thing's gonna get so huge. I don't know how likely that's actually gonna be. So we'll see. We're gonna go with this for now because the best solution that we found, uh, I can't say it's perfect, but that's basically where we're at. So with that in mind and starting today, we'll see how that goes. We can talk about it in the forums again and see what happened after a couple days. And again, that file is, uh, is now going into, in the handmade, it, um, well, if you have pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org, right, you have access to the source tree. That source tree, um, that same zip file will now have uh, inside the misc directory, there'll be this blackboard.art file, and that blackboard.art file will hopefully contain all of the drawings that I do on the stream now, uh, ad infinitum, so there we go. All right, <clears throat> let's see where we're at. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, and you know, Programming all day and then coming home and programming on the stream, I gotta admit, I don't always remember where I was in Handmade Hero because I have a lot of other programming that I have to do. Um, but if I remember correctly, what we were doing is we were using a rock bitmap uh, to basically have a virtual sword for our guy and we wanted to make the sword um, be something that he could use to basically attack uh, you know, another entity. So really basic stuff what's all we wanted to do. And I think we just did the part where we took the sword and you could basically drop it, like that's it. And so what we wanted to do now is we wanted to finish that off so you could actually kind of throw the sword Zelda style. And when I say sword here, I guess I mean rock because we don't actually have a sword bitmap. Probably should check something like that in at some point, but we are not go going to at this point because I don't have. Uh, so we want to go ahead and make it so you can kind of throw that there and make it into a valid you know, projectile that actually makes some sense. So we did most of the work yesterday, I think, for actually doing that. We might as well just go ahead and get that working today, right? Uh, so one thing you'll notice is it's kind of ridiculous now when we drop the sword. Like the whole point was not to drop the sword. The whole point was to throw the sword. Uh, so what we should probably do is go ahead and go in there and, uh, <clears throat> and make that stuff a little more sensible now. All right. So let's take a look uh, where, what we, when we actually did our sword stuff here. Um, this is where we actually put the sword into a location, right? Here's, here's how that worked. And what we'd want to do, presumably, because we're actually making the sword occur, uh, we're making the sword appear here, we probably want to go ahead and give it a velocity, right? Because that would be the easiest way to make it sort of sail across uh, somewhere. So if we wanted to, we could, we could make it have uh, a velocity by moving it into the high empty set and setting its uh, velocity equal to something, equal to the direction that you threw it in, and that would make it travel. Now again, the other thing that we said is we might want to make the sword only go a certain distance so that you can't throw it infinitely far. It will only go uh, a certain distance or maybe it like hits the ground. So maybe it kind of gets thrown in an arc. I don't know. 
Uh, we'll have to think about that. But point being, distance remaining, uh, we kind of put that in there just to see if we uh, could sort of initialize that to some number of meters, however far you could throw the sword. So I want to go ahead and put that in as well, right? So first things first, let's go ahead and set the controlling entity's uh, distance remaining. Uh, sorry, not the controlling entity, the sword entity, right? Uh, which we have here. Let's go ahead and make that sword entity uh, have it have a distance remaining. And let's just say that it's going to be, I don't know, three meters or something like that. Uh, maybe that's too short. We'll say five meters. And so as soon as the sword has traveled five meters, we'll just say that that's as far as the sword gets to go. And that's the end of it, right? Um, and so the sword, uh, at that point, we could also say, let's go ahead and set its uh, velocity. In order to set a velocity, we have to have it uh, in the high entity set. And so one thing that I could do here is <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one thing that I could do here again is uh, is force it into the high entity set. We didn't do that yet because there wasn't any particular reason to do so, uh, but it seems like now there actually is, right? And, and so what's kind of weird about this, and you can sort of see the, the way this is going, it's kind of annoying. Uh, again, sorry, I have a cold, so I'm still sniffly today. Believe me, it is no fun for me either. Um, anyway. Uh, the thing that I haven't been liking very much about the low entity, high entity thing, although it's been working relatively well for us in terms of how it's actually functioning, the code is kind of annoying because you constantly have all these weird like pointers and indices, and I don't love the fact that there's so much uh, typing involved there. I don't like the sort of uh, proliferation of that. And so what I'd like to do is finally maybe get it down to the point where it's something that's fairly condensable, like it's something that doesn't have to have so much kind of uh, jankiness there. And so I went back and forth uh, with using this entity structure. And what I'm wondering is if maybe we kind of need to just get that, uh, that sort of thing to be more standard, right? Maybe just kind of figure out what the calls need to be uh, where this entity actually happens. Uh, and then, you know, actually start using it. Because again, like the same thing's going to happen here, right? We're going to have like a high sword or something like this. Or, you know, here's low sword, right? Um, and, uh, and, uh, if I do it this way and then I've got the, the sword and I go force entity to high, right? It just, there's now there's a, two pointers to the sword or two things that it just, it just is kind of ugly and annoying, right? And so far we haven't really hit bugs because of it for whatever reason. It just doesn't seem to be error prone, but it just, re it results in too much typing and it makes the code harder to read. And that just is a constant drag on development. So it's just flagged in my mind as something that we need to address going forwards because I just don't like it and I'm not going to be willing to have that stay that way uh, ad uh, you know, forever basically, right? Um, so yeah, so let, you know, let's, uh, let's just assume that we're gonna deal with that and we'll think about it, keep it in the back of our heads uh, and just know that that's something uh, that needs to get addressed at some point. So let's say we go ahead um, and, and do here, we go ahead and force it into the high entity set. So it's going to be a high frequency update. Uh, and now we want to actually set uh, the, its velocity. Well, we now already have this D sword thing, which is the direction we want it to go in, right? So all we really need to know is how fast we want it to travel, what its velocity should be, right? And I don't really know how many meters per second a sword should travel. Um, I don't know. I feel like maybe uh, if the sword takes one second or two seconds, that seems fairly reasonable. So maybe, maybe you know it should go about two meters per second. I don't know. We'll tweak that constant and we'll see. Uh, but I think that if I go ahead and set that, I feel like that should, um, I feel like that should allow us to see that sword, uh, sword and by sword I mean rock, uh, travel actually in a direction uh, after we launch it. Although that was kind of uh, unspectacular. I just realized that uh, what we don't do yet is we don't actually have any kind of uh, update for our actual um, for our actual sword. So let's take a look here. Um, are we actually ever dealing with this guy? Uh, where do we actually for our move entity call, right? Um, for our move entity call, there we go. Uh, it looks like we are only ever. Um, let's see. Move entity. So on our update familiar call, we do move it. We don't ever have an update uh, call for our sword, right? So the sword itself will never actually move unless I actually, at some point, give it, uh, you know, give it the actual swords and say update it, and then it can do its move entity. Now I don't know if we actually need, and this is kind of an interesting point. I don't know that we actually need a special case 
of updating the sword. It probably could be using something that updates generic sort of projectile-y sorts of stuff. Uh, but again, this is code that we're meant to sort of suss out how we want the entity system to work. So for now, I'm going to write everything explicitly. And then I'm going to see what things look common to me across entities and pull those out as we go, right? Again, that's compression-oriented programming. I think it's the sanest way to go at this early stage when we're just trying to figure out exactly what we want everything to do so we don't build our, our game on top of a bad foundation, basically. So I think that if that's the case, then uh, really all we need to do for move entity, um, I guess now that I look at it, we don't, we don't have any acceleration for the sword. The sword stays the same speed the entire time. That's typically how a Zelda-style sword would, would work, right? Uh, so if I'm, if I'm doing that, I think really we don't have to do anything other than call the move entity routine that we always called before. Uh, and that move entity routine uh, should, in general, just work. Now, there's something that, uh, that I got to check here. I don't know if we actually, uh, yeah, so there's some things that we need to do in here. For now, I'm going to do it right here. Uh, I guess right, uh, let's see, let's see, right here. I want to basically turn off collision detection on the sword for now. So what I want to say for now only, and we're going to do something a little fancier here in a minute, uh, but for now only, I'm going to say that if something collides, uh, then it does this testing. But if it doesn't collide, it doesn't do that testing. And that allows things like the sword that are marked non-colliding uh, to just sail through stuff. Because I want to sort of think about what's going to happen to them uh, a little bit differently, right? So let's go ahead now and finish things off. Uh, in here, we kind of want to be able to do update sword, right? Like so. Uh, and we pass it to game state, the entity and the DT. Uh, and I think that that's most of what we would need uh, for our sword. Uh, that was a pretty uninspiring sword throw, uh, but I think it actually did move. Uh, but it, it, it's actually slowing down, and I believe that we still have a problem here. And in fact, this is a good time for us to actually start to pull this out, because we never actually did this with the familiar, with, uh, with the familiar and so on. We still have this, this bad notion where the player's speed and the acceleration and the drag and all that stuff are actually just built in. And that's really kind of bad because each individual object is going to want to have its own things, like its own drag and that sort of stuff. So the reason that our sword, sword stopped going is because our move entity just has baked into it the fact that there's always air resistance, right? Which gives him the same kind of like stopping uh, as the player has, which is, which is totally not what we would want at all. We want the sword to just sail, right? And so in order to fix that, what we would need to do is say that these are sort of things that are parameterized when the entity is, is being moved. Those are parameters uh, that control how this update actually happens, right? And so the first thing that I think we'd want to do here is make it so that player speed is no longer this kind of thing that gets multiplied, that the, the acceleration uh, gets multiplied by the player speed, right? That's what we were doing here. Uh, and I think that's just totally bogus. Uh, we don't want to do that at all. What we want to do is we want to say uh, that we have some notion that the acceleration has already been processed by whoever it is uh, that's calling us, and it is the valid acceleration for the frame, and move entity is only responsible for actually responding to that acceleration, right? Uh, so that's the first thing we want to do, right, which is acceleration. Uh, so valid acceleration passed in, and that's pretty easy to do. We'll do that today, I think. And the other thing what we want to do is in here where we have this drag coefficient, right? we'd like to sort of have some notion uh, that the drag coefficient was also uh, something that's passed in, right? And since this is something that affects the acceleration, right? Um, and it's, it has to do with the equations of motion as well. I think we probably will want to pass in this value, the actual coefficient, so that when we change this into an ordinary differ differential equation here, um, which we'll want to do a little bit later, I think that we'd want that to kind of just be baked in here so that you can just pass in a drag coefficient, right? Uh, and so what we could do, there's a number of different ways we could do this. I'm thinking that maybe uh, one of the easiest things to do would to be have some kind of an entity spec, right? Uh, and so a move spec, something like this. Uh, and maybe, you know, the move spec has something like uh, the acceleration and the drag coefficient, right? So this is the, uh, the drag coefficient here. Right, and that's going to be, um, you know, for the player that was uh, negative uh, 8.0 f. Uh, so this will actually be something where we'll take uh, the move spec. I guess we don't want it to be negative. We'll say that it's positive, right? Uh, so we'll say the move spec uh, drag, 
we'll just replace that there. Um, and then the player speed, we could make the speed be a parameter and then actually do have it do this as a directional thing potentially as well. I don't know if we want to do it that way. It just kind of gives it easier way to pass in stuff than having to have it roll its own. So maybe we'll try it that way. Uh, we'll have a speed parameter as well, right? And then we'll also have a bool, which is basically like um, a cap, uh, or uh, I should say um, uh, uh, unit max Excel vector or something like this, right? Uh, I don't really know what to call that exactly, but basically if we wanted to keep all of this stuff as stuff that you could use when you call move entity and it would all be fairly common working stuff, right? Uh, then what we could do is just say that, you know, the stuff that we were doing before is stuff you can just optionally have this function do for you, right? Uh, so if you want to make sure that your unit, that your uh, acceleration is at maximum unit length, so that basically what you're doing is you're using it as a proportional scalar, like, like with the analog stick, like what we were doing, it'll do that for you. Um, for the player speed stuff, it'll actually do that for you as well, right? And so this is going to be... Uh, speed equals that for when we actually move that out there. So what we could do here is say that also happens, right? Move spec uh, dot speed. And then you also pass in that drag. And now what you could do is you could, you could have the entity. Uh, and in addition to the acceleration, you could pass in that movement spec, which is basically just a thing which says how, you know, um, how this entity moves, what are its equations of motion. And we could add some things perhaps later that will tune the, the motion as well. Uh, other things that we might want to control, right? Uh, and so now we know that if we were to uh, make one for the player, you know, it would look like like this. Um, and uh, unit max cell vector equals 1.0, right? Uh, or sorry, equals true. And so if we wanted to call this for the player, now we could just go ahead and, and do that um, in the move entity call for the player, right? Uh, so here's the one for the familiar, and we know that that was also using the one that the player was using, although probably it shouldn't, probably should be set uh, a little bit different than that. But, you know, uh, we'll sort of get to that when we actually are, are, are fussing with things of that nature. Um, so there we go. We can pass that there. Uh, we can go ahead and, you know what, we probably want to have this be a default too. We'll make this be a default move spec, something like that. Uh, in fact, I like that a lot. So we'll say that. Uh, that way we know that we've always kind of got some kind of a default there. Uh, so let's say move spec, uh, default move spec, like so. And put one here. So we don't know what the speed of the sword is exactly. I think, uh, oh, we do. We know that the, the speed is, is zero. It can't accelerate. We know that it has no drag. And we know that we don't actually need it to uh, do any of this stuff. Uh, so that's, that's just completely not doing anything. Um, so we got the default move spec there. We've got our move entity. There we go. And then we've got uh, the same same stuff going on here. So that's going to want to use uh, basically this guy for now. There we go. Uh, so all right. So that's pretty much all there is to that. Uh, and again, I don't really know if I love that or not, uh, but it just seemed like a sensible thing to do. Uh, just to kind of clean up what was happening in that function and kind of move it out into something that we can deal with. Uh, and so what happens here in this, uh, in this default one is I just wanted to make one where uh, the default things that should happen uh, will happen, right? So that, that people, if we add, basically what I want to do here is if we add members to this, because they're physics parameters, I feel like it might be too hard to do. I, I usually try to make it so that everything defaults to zero. But in this case, the defaults being zero might not make sense because in physics, some things want to default to one, some things want to default to zero. And you have to name things in very odd ways to make that work. And so in this case, I just kind of decided, well, I'm going to go with actually having some kind of initialization here. And so basically, most people will just initialize that to the default spec and they'll go from there. Uh, so let's just verify that everything seems to be still working. Our familiar head is still following us around, which is good. Um, and there's our little sword, quote unquote sword. Uh, off it goes. And so that's what we wanted to have happen. It's a bit slow for a sword. Uh, so I think to say the very least, we would probably want uh, to make sure that that sword goes a little bit faster in the future. Uh, so let's do that. But also what we now want to do is go ahead and implement that thing where it can only travel uh, for a certain distance before it goes away. 
And so, all right, first of all, our, our DP is actually going to have to be much higher than that. And then our distance remaining, uh, what we want our distance remaining to do basically is, is to sort of uh, act as like a ticker. Um, and so what we do here, I think, is we'd say, uh, let's take wherever the entity was, and then we'll take wherever the entity is now. So we'll just say the old position of the entity um, equals the entity's uh, you know, position at the start. And then we'll say uh, the, the distance uh, traveled equals uh, the length of, um, of, of basically this vector right here. So it's going to be the entity's current position minus his old position. Uh, so that'll be the length of, of that vector. And then what we want to do is subtract the distance traveled uh, basically from that. Now there's a little bit of a bug in here. And I'm not sure whether we want to address it now or not, but we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, at f the first thing we want to do is say if this distance remaining drops uh, to zero, right? So if the distance remaining falls below the, the, the um, uh, if we basically used up all the distance that we had to travel, we want to go ahead and make the sword disappear, right? Uh, so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and change our entity location. We want to change uh, the, the low entity uh, index, right, for this guy. Um, change entity position, entity location. Uh, so like so. We want to go ahead and change its position to essentially nowhere, right? So we want to take, um, we want to take that low entity, sword.low. Uh, this is actually sword.lowindex, I guess. Why do we have, this shouldn't be sword. This should just be entity. I don't know why I typed sword. It's just entity. There we go. Uh, so we go ahead and pass that. Uh, we have its old position, which is just where it was, right? Uh, and in some sense, in some sense, I don't even know why we're passing this anymore in this, this utility function, because the old position is just wherever it was, right? Um, so this is always going to be entity low p, right, uh, is that old position. So I wonder if we should just get rid of that now. It does seem like we should. But anyway, and then the new position is nowhere, right? The new position is it's just not going to be anywhere at all. Uh, so I think that would, would basically do it. Uh, the only thing that, yeah, I guess we haven't done yet is we haven't made a length for our vectors. We made something that does the length squared, but we don't have anything that actually gets the length. Uh, but that's not very difficult, obviously, because if we want to get the, the um, length of something and we already know how to get the squared length, all we have to do is square root it, right? Um, and square rooting <clears throat> something that's the length squared will get us the length, right? Uh, so that's pretty easy. So we'll go ahead and return that, uh, and off we go. Now, at this point, you may be asking, well, square root is undefined for negative numbers. You're correct, it is. But what you have to remember is, since we're calling length squared, there is no actual possible way that it can produce a negative number. Now, uh, why is that, right? Well, the reason, uh, because if you remember back when we talked about the math, the inner product is when you take a vector, uh, well, two vectors, and you multiply their components by each other. So you multiply the x's by the x's and the y's by the y's. Now, normally that could produce a negative number quite easily as long as one of these was negative and the other one was positive, uh, and the positive um, you know, times a negative is a negative. A negative plus another negative would be a negative. That'd be really easy. You can imagine lots of ways that this result could be negative. And so you would end up taking the square root of a negative number, which is not a good idea, right? Complex numbers, not something we want to have happening in here. Because we don't even have any place to store them. We're just storing a real value, right? But. You have to remember, we are taking the length of a vector, which means we're passing itself uh, as both parameters to that inner product, which means it's going to be its own x times its own x and its own y times its own y, which means it's going to be a square um, t plus a square. And any number squared is always going to be positive unless that number was complex to begin with, right? Any real number times itself, if it was negative, it's two negatives. Uh, so you know, negative times negative is going to be a positive. If it was two positives, uh, then it was going to be a positive. And if it's two zero, it's going to be a zero. So there's really no way this can possibly be a negative because it's going to be one positive number or zero plus another positive number or zero, which means that our square root essentially can never fail in this case, right? Uh, so that's easy enough, and we don't really have to worry about that too much. Uh, of course, I guess what we do have to worry about is the fact that we've never actually defined our square root, um, which I, is kind of odd. We've never had to take a square root. It's right there. Did I spell it wrong? What happened? 
Uh, or is it that handmade math uh, isn't in, is, comes after it or something like this? Square root, um, let's see, let's see. Where are those intrinsics? Uh, where is handmade math, I guess, is the more important. Handmade math. Uh, yeah, so that's our problem. That needs to go like that. All right. So we're, we're basically done here. We're going to have to, that's, that's totally wrong. Fix up the typos here. Uh, and there we go. Let's see, change into the location converted five from world position. That's true. That needs to be the address of the position and that's done. Uh, so now I think that should move it after it's done traveling or uh, we might get an error. So that's interesting. Uh, we hit one of our assertions uh, that basically says that one of the things that we were passing was not canonical. What happened there? What happened there? Change entity location. So old P and new P O. So I think when we wrote this function, we never actually, um, we never actually uh, did one for a new P being zero. So we've never, we've never actually allowed you to change entity's location from somewhere to nowhere, if you will. Uh, so basically all that assertion was telling us was, um, well, actually, I don't think that was an assertion. That, might, that was probably actually a null uh, pointer to your reference, but I could be wrong about that. I think what we actually want to do here, oh, no, we actually, it, it was an assertion. What we actually want to do is just say, if both of them are valid and they were in the new chunk, then we leave the entity where it is. Otherwise, we process it separately, right? And so that's, I think we just needed to just check that there, um, and that should be, that should be it. I think. Let's find out. Let's find out. Um, hmm, that's a little bit odd. What are we doing? What is the actual assertion there? Old P is valid. So is it suggesting that it's not actually valid? I can't actually tell. Yeah, I want to see what it's actually complaining about. Access violation writing location 000. zero, zero. What? exactly inside that assert is writing a location. Well, you know what? That may just be, that, that may be a slightly spurious uh, way that that's being reported. So let's, let's actually step in there and make sure uh, that we actually know um, for reals exactly what's going on there. Uh, so what's happening here? Um, let's see, let's find out. So the new chunk P and the old chunk P, that old chunk P is invalid. So basically this is still moving the guy after he essentially has been moved to zero. So what I, I guess was probably the case here, uh, now that I think about this, uh, is if we've moved him, I wonder if this is a case where we have, uh, well, let's go ahead and see here if we're actually moving somebody out and then he's still in the high entity set. So while he's still in that high entity set, he gets moved again. Um, and then that causes a problem. I assume that's what's happening. Let's, let's actually double check uh, and find out uh, if that's the case. So um, we need to be in the other file. So what we want to do is we want to see what happens uh, at the end here when we move the entity. Uh, so the sword, we want it to disappear at this point. We go in and say change entity location. Uh, we go ahead and we change it. Everything's fine. Uh, the low entity is now outside of that set. Uh, and so our sword entity, which I want to kind of pay attention to now, let's see which one he is, right? Entity uh, dot low index. So he's 92205, right? Uh, and we can always view him as well by just saying the game state low entities uh, 92205, like so. Uh, there he is. And you can see that he's, he's got an invalid chunk X, which is what we want because he doesn't exist in the world at the moment. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty good. Now, what I suspect is happening, and I'll, I'll just say this again um, because, in fact, thinking it through, I'm almost positive this is what's happening. So when we change an entity's location, uh, I even put a to-do in here about this before because I was thinking that it probably should happen. You'll notice we said if this moves an entity into the, into the camera mount, should it automatically go into the highest set immediately? There's a corollary to this is if it moves out of the camera bounds, uh, should it be removed from the high set uh, immediately, right? Um, and basically, immediately is probably the wrong word here. We, we maybe don't want it to be immediate, but we may want it to happen um, 
in some kind of a more controlled way than waiting for the next time that set camera gets called, right? And so what I believe is happening here is we change this entity's location and then in the high set, we don't actually do any uh, work to sort of ensure that it's, uh, that it's removed from that high set and not still getting updated in the high set as if it's still in the location that it was before we moved it, right? Because we're only changing that low P and we're moving it out into the middle, uh, out into non-existence. That should remove it from the high set, but unfortunately it won't, right? Like there's no, there's no code that will actually do that because the only thing that removes things from the high set is when they're high position moves outside the camera bounds, right? So I think there's probably a hacky, not particularly good way to solve this problem, right? Uh, and that would basically be to set the entity's high position to something super invalid, right? Like you could imagine uh, setting it, uh, taking that and just doing something like, you know, this kind of nonsense, right? Uh, that would probably do it for us, uh, but I want something that's not going to be so janky, right? I want to think this through and do it in a kind of a relatively easy way. But I just want to see if that's the actual problem, uh, is that it's not getting removed uh, from that set. I want to see, yeah, so that's what I assumed, and that is actually the case. Uh, so that's what I expected, and so we have to kind of think about that, and this is actually a very important problem in my mind. Uh, this is exactly the sort of thing uh, that we want to kind of look at a little more intelligently because it's the kind of thing um, it's the kind of thing that you really want to get right or you're going to have lots of subtle bugs uh, of exactly this kind because having two frequencies of up, uh, update for your entities is a complex thing. If you don't get the basics of it right, you'll constantly be fighting this battle of bugs like this that, that annoy you and uh, waste your development time. All right. So the question is, what do we want to do here? Let's review how our entity system's actually working, right? Um, and I use the term entity system loosely, but the entity code that we have so far, right? We don't really have an entity system per se. So what we're doing is we're spinning through these high entities that we have and we're updating them as we go. And so when we update the sword, uh, eventually it's time for the sword to sort of get moved out of existence. And so one of the things that uh, becomes true here is it shouldn't participate. Once it gets moved out of existence, it's possibly the case that it shouldn't participate any further in anything else that might happen on this frame or on subsequent frames. So one thing that we could do is essentially move, mark things for deletion or remove things as part of this loop, right? That would be the first tier way to deal with this. And the example there would be some sort of a control flow thing that tells us that, right? So you could imagine something like this, which is like remove, right? Should something, should a high entity in, uh, index get removed, right? Uh, and so we'd we'll, set that to false. And then what we do is for any of these people who have an update call, right? You'd basically have a remove call that would, that would return to us whether or not we wanted the thing uh, to get removed. Now, that's all right. Um, and what we do is at the end of this right here, we just process that out. I don't super love that uh, as an idea necessarily. Uh, I think what I prefer, <clears throat> I would prefer something uh, that could set that on sort of a more uh, global, in a, in a more global sense perhaps, something that could do it so that it'll get processed the next time through uh, on maybe on that set camera call, something like that, right? Uh, I think that's really what I would prefer. So. What I want to do is take a look at that set camera call and see how that's working, right? Right now, what it's doing is it's saying uh, offset and check frequency by area, right? That's the, that's the call that loops through and says who's still in the sort of the play field. It would be nice if that in and of itself could just check to see whether a high entity should or should not still be around, right? And it seems to me like that's a more sensible place to do this potentially. Uh, just thinking it through, you know, something like this, uh, where we would say, um, you know, if high, uh, you know, is alive or something like this, or, or we could even do it a little bit more straightforward. We could say uh, that, that, um, that sort of that low entity position, we could say if it's low entity position is valid, right? Um, which I guess do we, we don't really know the low entity position here, so it kind of bites an extra lookup, which I don't love. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of 
uh, we'll sort of do that for now and just see we can always we can always put in something to accelerate that later if we want to right uh, so I'll just go ahead and do low entity low uh, and we'll go ahead and grab that guy off of here like so so what we'll do is we'll say if that oops if that low P uh, is is valid um, that's that's one reason but if it's not valid if if uh, if the entity has moved out of existence basically and its position is in the ether uh, then we're not going to leave it in that high entity set. Now, I don't know if that's the best criteria for now, but that's certainly stronger, I think, than what we had previously. And I like that a little bit better. Uh, so let's take a look at what happens there. Um, let's just take, take a look at that. We've got one other thing that we kind of need to address um, when we do that, though, which is that when we're going through this loop, uh, if we don't remove people right away, then they're still getting checked for their current location. I don't know that that's necessarily bad, but it's something to think about, right? I mean, the sword for the rest for the rest of the high entities before we get to the end of this loop, the sword is still where it was originally, which I don't actually know if that's a bad thing, um, but it's something we have to think about. Uh, all right, and so I think that's also, so you can see that also solves the problem just fine, right? Um, our sword still seems to be incredibly slow, which is odd, uh, and I don't know why that does not seem to have gotten any velocity either. That was particularly weird, if I do say so myself. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why our sword would ever not have velocity. How did that happen? That's pretty amusing. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, D sword. We always do give the sword some velocity, right? Yeah. Uh, distance remaining five, it's high DP. It can't collide with anything, so it shouldn't ever be able to have a velocity that's not zero, right? Because we specifically said that swords don't collide, pretty sure anyway, um, when we did add sword, right? Collides is false. So when we're calling move entity on the sword, I would think there should be no way for it to ever actually get into a state um, where, where it can't, uh, where its velocity would get clipped, right? Because in theory, uh, let's see, hit high entity index, it can't ever set hit high entity index, right? It's always equal to zero. Uh, so it should never actually, I don't think, um, be able to have a velocity that is, yeah, that is zero. So how did that happen? I'm very confused about that. Uh, that's very troubling. That doesn't, seem like a, that doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to have happen. I wanna know what I'm missing, basically. Uh, because if this always gets set, I'm trying to think if there's any other way that it could get set with the DP not being equal to that. Uh, but its DP should basically always be this. I don't know why its DP ever would be anything else. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a little disconcerting. So I'm trying to think of what would be the best way to catch that error, right? Like what's the best way to hunt down how that happened? Because it obviously happened, I saw it happen. Um, so let's think about this. Basically we get a low entity. Um, There shouldn't ever really be a way. Yeah, I cannot think of a way to really have that happen. Gosh, that is really strange. Well, let's take a look here. When an entity gets forced into high, aha, there we go. Uh, so that could easily be our problem. If the entity was going to get moved into high uh, by someone other, yeah, so, so basically that is almost certainly uh, where our problem comes from, right? Uh, so when the entity gets moved into its high frequency uh, space, its velocity at that point, right, um, is going to, yeah, is going to basically be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, its velocity at that point would get zeroed. So one question is, is there any way, right, that a sword could have that happen? It does seem like it would be possible for the sword to get placed down in low frequency, like it, it gets transitioned out of low frequency and then transitioned back into high frequency somehow or something like this, right? I, I don't think that's entirely out of the question, and so I assume that is exactly uh, what happened. So let's take a look. Uh, move entity. Let's see if we can actually make that happen. Force 
empty into high. Uh, so make entity high frequency. So let's one way we could do this to try and make that uh, that case is we could go ahead and do an assert here, um, or rather we won't do an assertion. Let's just set a breakpoint, right? Uh, we'll set a breakpoint where uh, if that entity low um, type equals a sword, uh, then I'm going to set a breakpoint there, right? So so if it, if I'm looking at a sword, like so, uh, break here, right, uh, equals five. So that way I can go ahead and just try to make that bug reproduce itself. And then I can also see at that point, I'd be able to see the call stack to see who it was uh, exactly who was causing that to happen, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, so yeah. So in this case, I think we're okay um, because this should actually be called uh, from game update and render, which is here. So it's gonna, it's gonna actually call that there, right? There we go. Um, and then it gets called a second time. That seems erroneous, right? That doesn't seem right to me. Make entity high frequency. Why wasn't it high frequency already? What, what's going on here? Did it get moved out of the high frequency set? You saw it happen, didn't you? That seems erroneous to me. Let's see if that happens every time. That just seems bad. So let's go ahead and debug that. That seems like a bad situation. I don't think that should be happening. So basically, when we make entity high frequency, right, make entity high frequency, um, there's two cases that's happening on the sword. One is happening uh, when we're basically setting the camera. And so what we're doing is we're looping through everything and we're moving it here. Uh, so I'm guessing that what must happen is offset and check frequency by area must actually be removing the sword from the high frequency set for some reason, right? Because otherwise, why would that ever happen, right? So it must be the case that like our low P is judged as invalid or something weird happens. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and say, uh, that this right here uh, is a case. Well, I guess I could do it in, in make entity low frequency, right? Low frequency. Uh, so in here, what I could do is say, uh, okay, let's go ahead and, and see uh, when we do this deletion. Um, yeah, so we just do this. If entity low, uh, and we've got our um, <clears throat> type, and we want that to be the sword. Let's see who's moving that into the low frequency set, right? Uh, so that happens. And then, it, yeah, so, so something, something is amiss, in my opinion. Because as you can see, we've hit this twice, but we never hit the, oh, <laughs> no, that's not true. I lied. <laughs> we, did, we actually have to set the breakpoint. Sorry about that. Spoke too soon. I'm assuming that the, I'm assuming that should fire, but uh, it didn't, and I realized it's because I didn't actually set a breakpoint on it. All right. So there we go. That actually hits that breakpoint, which is what we expect, and then it hits this breakpoint. All right. So basically, we've got we've got nastiness, um, and that's good because now we can actually debug our nastiness, uh, which is what we want. So the first time it, end, it enters into the high frequency set, that's exactly what we wanted to have happen, right? Because that's where we actually forced it into high and that's where we actually set its state, right? And so that's all good and off we go. Now the next time through, we find that we set it to low frequency and the question is, why are we setting it to low frequency? Like what's the reasoning, right, uh, behind that? Of course, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio makes it as hard as possible for that to happen uh, by giving you absolutely no information whatsoever. Uh, what we'd like to be able to see is like what happened in here, but we can't, unfortunately. Uh, and so what we want to do is say, all right, it failed one of these things. Uh, so let's see if we can figure out which one it failed. Um, yes, thank you so much, Visual Studio, for being absolutely awful uh, at everything that you do. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if I can set the next statement to just be inside this routine. Um, uh, actually, you know what I could do? Let me, let me step out of this first. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, well, you know what? This actually has the things I need in it uh, to some degree, I suppose. Uh, not really, because they're gonna get deleted. Ah, uh, Visual Studio. All right, well, let me see. I guess what I could do is trick Visual Studio into being less of the world's worst debugger and maybe only the world's second worst debugger uh, by putting in some dummy line that will allow us to still inspect the variables we actually want to inspect. Uh, so here is our dummy line here, like so. Uh, and maybe this can help, um, you know, as you know, people at Microsoft don't actually debug any of their code. So they don't actually have to worry about looking at code in the debugger. So it probably never occurred to them that people who actually do debug code and ship it without the bugs in it um, would want to actually see the variables in their code while they were stepping through it. That's kind of one of the things that debuggers sometimes do. But if you never launch a debugger and you just send it out the door however it is, you probably don't think about those things. Anyway, uh, so let's see. Uh, we got our dummy line here. So now what I'm hoping to do is when I take a look at this make entity low frequency, I can now actually hopefully step out here. And since we've inserted this dummy line, I'll be able to actually look at these values, right? Um, so there's the values that we actually have. Here's our high entity. Here's where he is. Uh, and he's set out in the middle of nowhere. That is pretty darn clear, right? Um, so that's pretty telling. And uh, the low position for him, um, not, not super sure I understand why he's set out in the middle of nowhere, uh, but he is. And then his low position uh, is actually, doesn't seem to correlate with that at all to me, right? Uh, am I wrong about that? But that, that seems uh, fairly clear. So he's failing this, but I don't understand why he is getting these ridiculous values set. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't follow uh, why that's the case. So I want to figure out what's going on there. Uh, in this set camera call, um, what is the entity offset per frame? Entity offset per frame is nothing. Um, so that's, I guess, what, you know, to be expected. Uh, we're in this first game update and render through. So I don't know, that's, that's pretty bizarre. Let's find out why that's happening. So when we first enter into the high space, where does the entity uh, think it is? Entity high, let's see here. Uh, and so moving into camera space, this is where uh, it thinks it is at zero, zero, right? That's where it's thinking the entity is at the moment. That's the camera space P, right? Uh, so let's get out of here uh, and double check that. We've made the entity high frequency. Here it is. Uh, we set the low uh, and the high there. Um, so let's take a look here, sword like this. Uh, let's see the low. Uh, and the high, like so. Uh, so just taking a look here at these values, they all look very, very sane. Um, nothing particularly odd there. I will say if that's the offset, negative five, five, nine, um, I am wondering a little bit, is that actually what it should be? Because I guess I don't know exactly where the, well, they might be that the camera's there as well. Let's double check. Uh, to see what the camera state actually is. So you can see whether that's a sane value, right? Just want to make sure that that's, that's actually makes sense. Yeah, so that's where the camera is. So that all worked out exactly as it should. Um, and then we're going to come down here um, and we're going to actually update the sword. Uh, so let's take a look at that call uh, because that's another thing that could do it. Uh, so if we take a look at our entity now, like so, there we go. Uh, okay. So in here, in entity, uh, we still have reasonable values uh, for our high and our low values. And so I'm wondering how we end up with such ridiculous stuff. Uh, I'm guessing that something happens in here uh, that causes that to occur. So uh, let's take a look. So inside move entity, let's see what happens in there. Uh, when we do our movement, what's our DDP look like? It's all zeros. Uh, what's our new player P look like? Let's take a look at what, so let's just take a look at what it's trying to do. New player P. Um, that's a totally sane uh, thing, as far as I can tell anyway. Uh, so the desired position. Uh, so let's take a look. What's that player delta? What's the team in? Yep, all looks pretty good. 
Uh, nothing particularly out of the ordinary there, as far as I can tell anyway. Um, yeah, so entity hi p is totally sane values. Um, totally sane values. So now let's take a look at what happens when we do our map into chunk space. When we map, in, map into chunk space, uh, we get another totally sane value. Um, so that seems reasonable as well. Uh, and then when we go ahead and do this, let's see what happens here. Uh, so we get our new P, our low entity P is going to get set. Um, so there we go. And let's take a look at that. Low entity, like so. Um, and that's totally fine as well. Uh, so coming out of here, uh, this actually looks all pretty good, right? Nothing weird um, actually happened to our guy. So I'm not sure why we ended up with such uh, ridiculous values there, um, but we did, unless that was just a trick of the debugger showing us wrong values, which could totally be the case, obviously. Um, let's go ahead and keep going uh, with this uh, investigation because I'm not satisfied that we have any idea what's going on at this point. All right. Uh, so if I continue to look at my low entities, I could also look at my high entities, I suppose. Here is the high entity index, it's high index uh, 97. Uh, so what I could do is say, let's also take a look uh, at it here. Uh, so what I want to do is say, I've got my game state. Oh! You know what? I don't think this has anything to do with it, but I just thought of something particularly ugly uh, that we definitely probably... That we, we, that, that, that's going to cause problems at some point, although I don't know if that some point is anywhere near now, but I just thought of something really gross. I don't even want to say it. It's so bad. Um, the things I do for the stream. Uh, the things I do for the stream. All right. Uh, no, that's one off there. Um, high entities is that uh, like that? There we go. So this is our high entity. And we can delete all this stuff and just look at our high entity and our low entity uh, for this guy, right? So here's our sword, our, our full description of the sword using uh, totally hard offsets. So we can just kind of see as we go um, what's going to happen there. So let's find out when that craziness actually occurs. Uh, here's the drawing code. That's fine. Uh, so now we're going to have to step back into uh, basically game update and render, right? Uh, game update and render. Uh, so we're going to have to see coming through here. I assume we're still all good. Uh, we go through our controller index. We haven't done anything. Um, so there's nothing weird that has to happen here. Uh, let's see. We've got the low entities are fine. Uh, yep, nothing weird there. Again, this is all fine. And our entity is still totally sane. It's not in its ridiculous state that it was. Uh, and so now when we come through here uh, and we're going to go ahead and do our set camera call, I assume this is where we get the weirdness where the entity goes haywire, um, although I still have not been able to determine why that would happen. We're going to see if we can find it. Uh, so we get the camera bounds. We step into the, the check, the frequency check. Um, and then we're going to go through and start actually checking these uh, and we check them and they probably should all be valid, I would say, right? Um, I would think they'd all be valid. So I'm going to set a breakpoint at the end of this function, just let it run um, through there. And so it was able to go through that no problem. Uh, so that wasn't where we got made low frequency. So the first time through set camera was actually not a problem, uh, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, that's, that's actually pretty, pretty unusual. Um, yeah, that's, that's bizarre, but okay. Uh, so off we go. Uh, and then, so when we finally do it, I don't know how long it has been uh, since that has happened. That's kind of weird, right? This happens at some point, uh, but we're not really sure when. It's not in the first time we call offset and check frequency by area. It's in some time uh, sometime quite thereafter. So I'm guessing that that might mean uh, that it's only when we do that change location uh, because the change location call would cause that to happen. It looked like it was happening a lot faster than that, but I guess it wasn't. So if you remember, 
um, right when we do our update, which is uh, it's right somewhere. Where is our update call? Update call. Update call. I wish I had a better way to jump to functions in here. I'm sure there must be one by now. I just don't know what it is in Visual Studio. So it must be that we're actually doing this, right? Oh, pfft. <laughs> awesome. Man, I tell you, on stream, I'm always so absent-minded. So we still left this in there. Why did I leave that in there? I said specifically that that was just a quick hack. And then like, here's the other thing we should do. And then there I go, like totally leaving it in there. Oh man, that's hilarious. <sighs> yeah, the number of typos I have on the stream is awful. Um, I assume we've had some legitimate bugs so far, but man, the time I spend on the typos is way worse. I don't know. I kind of need, I, I need some kind of a thing for, for I got to figure out how I can talk and pay attention to my own code at the same time. I'm not really sure how to do that. Okay, let's get back to where we were uh, before that ridiculousness. All right, uh, so there's the high frequency, uh, and there it goes. Man, that was so annoying. Um, all right, so that's actually correct. That should be low frequency, um, so that's fine. I want to see if I can repro that bug again without that ridiculous being in there, uh, just so I can, because that was probably the entirety of the bug. So lame. Um, yeah. So there's one thing that we are doing at the moment, though, uh, that's a little annoying, um, which is I feel like, I don't know exactly how I was able to do that, but that's pretty cool. Uh, we don't actually ensure that we set the position back uh, to where it was, so I'm actually able to do kind of a cool hook shot thing here sometimes, like right there. <laughs> so that means basically... Uh, if you look at the order, it's kind of interesting. So this is something that we need, we've been needing to do for a while, uh, and that's the first time we've actually had this happen. So if you think about the order of operations here, everyone's getting updated in a particularly coherent way, uh, except for this ridiculousness. This is totally outside of the, we update the player inside this, uh, this thing where we're, we're processing the input in a total, in a way that doesn't actually ensure uh, that things that should have happened to the sword, for example, actually have happened to the sword already. Uh, so the set camera call, for example, hasn't happened, which means that you could, if you wanted to, uh, end up getting the low entity of the sword uh, and having the low sword's P be not valid, right? Um, but uh, it still wouldn't actually be outside of the high entity set, right? Because it hadn't got moved out of there yet which means that its position in high entity space, this wouldn't actually trigger anything, right? Which wouldn't move, which wouldn't restore its position. I know this is a particularly weird thing to think about, uh, but basically you could think of us as a bug in one of two different ways. One is that the uh, order of operations is odd. And that's something that we have to sort of work out uh, because we kind of have this done piecemeal here. So one thing that we do kind of want to do is collect our user input and then we want to update the player in a coherent way uh, outside here, right? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing that we want to be able to do uh, is when we change a location, we kind of have this problem where if you change a location and the entity has a representation in high space, we want those to stay in sync. And right now those can easily get out of sync. And so the question is, how do we design our system so that those don't uh, get out of sync, right? And that's kind of a tricky problem. Again, this is the reason why I'm trying to do the having two different sets of entity updates is because you can see it's a lot more complicated to write the code this way than it would be if we didn't do this. Um, and so I'm trying to, whenever I can, uh, I'm trying to pick the most complicated uh, type of thing you might have to do and do it that way to show how you work through all of the problems that are involved in it, right? Um, because I want to show how you can make any systems that scale up to huge numbers of entities. Even if we could save a lot of time by not doing that, I don't really want to go that route. Uh, so I would rather spend the time figuring out exactly how to, to work through those things. So there you go. So I think that's what we want to probably focus on next time. I would say that's going to be our to-do for tomorrow 
is to sort of, okay, now that we have a real relatively complicated situation happening here uh, where we can see the consequences of things, I would say tomorrow's goal is to pull out this code and streamline it so that we can have a sane system for dealing with positions uh, where we're not going to get bugs uh, in terms of things moving in and out of the high end set like that. Like what can we do uh, to basically increase the usability of that system? So I'm going to put a to-do in here, do uh, for tomorrow. Basically what we're going to do is say, uh, now that we have some real usage examples, um, let's solidify the positioning system. Okay. Uh, and that'll be fine for you tomorrow. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the Q&A. Uh, please prefix your questions with Q colon so I will see them. And if you could keep it to stuff we've done today's stream or on a previous stream. If you want to ask off topic questions, that's okay for the pre stream, but not post stream. So if you want to ask off topic questions, come back tomorrow 15 minutes before the stream scheduled to start. That's uh, 745 Pacific Standard Time, 7.45 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, if you want to ask off topic questions, that's when we do it. Owl of Shame. Do you think that's the Owl of Shame? I don't know. I tend not to Owl of Shame myself if I make a typo because, like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, well, I don't know. We could do Owl of Shame. I'm fine with the Owl of Shame for that, but that really wasn't much of a bug. That was just me having typed something in and forgetting, which is really easy to do on the stream. So I don't feel like that was a legitimate mental bug, like I architected the system wrong or other things like that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with an Alice shame for that. I just don't know how to deserve it. It really was. Do I ever use GDB? Uh, yeah, on Linux I do. Do you test more than just using asserts. Uh, sometimes it depends on what the code is. Why did you create a struct for each vector type instead of using plain float arrays? Uh, the reason is because uh, I like to be able to overload uh, to have math operators. So basically, if you take a look at um, if you take a look at handmade math, you can see that we actually do operators for stuff like times and that sort of thing. Uh, and the reason for that is to make it easier to read. So let's say you've got some code, right? Uh, and I have V2A and I have V2B or whatever, right? Like this. Uh, it's much easier to read uh, A times B like this, right? Um, let's say 5 times B uh, equals 3 plus A, uh, C, right? That's very easy to read. Uh, the equivalent, if you were to just use float arrays, is very, very difficult to read. It looks like this. It's... Uh, you know, mull or whatever you want to call it, uh, scale vector. I think I've often called it scale like that. Um, so it would look like this. These would obviously all be um, floats. So you would end up with float A of 2, float B of 2, uh, like so, uh, float C of 2. And so you do uh, C, like that, you'd, you'd have to multiply it that way. So 5 times B goes into C, uh, 3 times A goes into, and these would actually, I guess you'd, you'd do them temp 1 and temp 2, right? Float temp 1, uh, temp 2, like so. Uh, so you got temp 1, temp 2, you do those two, uh, then you do an add, uh, and you do C, temp1, temp2, right? That's what the code looks like. Uh, so that's why you don't use float arrays is because, you know, which do you want to be able to read in your code? That um, or that, right? Uh, and so just looking at them even without any declarations on them, uh, you can see that this is just really hard to read uh, compared to this. Do you think version control would help when you go off on a tangent for the stream? You can roll back hacks like that. Uh, not unless you're going to check in like every 10 seconds. Um, so no, I don't really think version control would help.
Not a question, but that hook shot thing actually looked like it would be kind of fun to play with. I actually agree with you. Um, so I should probably, I was thinking that when I was playing, I was like, I should probably put this in the game somehow. Uh, so I'll have to try and remember to add that. Um, in fact, I guess I'll add that right now um, to my reminders file. I have my gameplay reminders file here. Uh, and so I could go ahead and do that. Uh, so we'll say uh, basically bendable shot, uh, which allows you to change direction of the shot once or something like this. Um, I'm not sure how that would work out in practice, but I agree it was kind of fun. What are your feelings on the vector multiply operator performing a dot product? Um, I don't love it. I tend to use inner for that. Uh, but given the fact that like all shader languages now do it that way, um, no, they don't actually. They do the Hadamard product, don't they? Yeah, so I would actually say double, double bad. Um, I would say that it's probably real dangerous to have vector multiply perform a dot product because shading languages, I'm pretty sure they use the Hadamard product if you use the multiply operator. So now if you're in a shading language, you're going to read those and think they're dot products because your brain's been like trained to that and you're constantly like, oh wait, no, in the shading language it's not. So I'd be real careful. I, I, would, not, I would not have vector multiply perform a dot product. Personally, I don't think vector multiply should even be defined. I think you should have to say which kind of product you want uh, just to avoid mistakes. Uh, but if you were going to define one, I'd say you'd probably have to define it through the Hadamard product because otherwise every time you switch between shader and your code, you have to do a mental swap and you're going to make mistakes, I think. I know I would. Do you keep your assertions for release code? If not, at what point do you remove them? Uh, release mode by definition compiles out the assertions. So uh, yeah, I mean, the, the final version of the code just has its assertions compiled out. Uh, the pound of, you pound to find the assertion to not be anything, and that's the thing you ship. Why wouldn't you encapsulate each entity type into its separate classes? Uh, so we haven't quite gotten there yet. I would say you're going to have to come back in like a week or two when we're actually talking about how we want to break down the entity system so I can explain to you why you don't do that. Uh, we haven't actually made an entity system yet, so even if I was going to do that, I wouldn't have done it yet because it's too early to start thinking about what should be an entity class uh, or what the different entity classes should be, like sword or hero or whatever. Um, so even if I was a fan of object-oriented programming and inheritance and stuff like that, I wouldn't do it yet. I would wait until I have more done and see how things should break apart. But even that said, uh, when we get to that time, I will not be doing that because there's, I, I, don't like the, that concept that you're talking about just in general, the concept that like a sword has a sword class, I strongly dislike. Um, I don't think that's a good programming model. I don't think it's very efficient uh, for game development. So, so I don't do that even so, but you'll have to come back later if you, if you want to talk about that more because that's something we'll be getting into in, in a lot of detail. And Tom Forsyth is backing me up on uh, the shading language thing that the Hadamard product is the standard product in the shading language. So basically, yeah, like I would say, I would say it's, it's pretty darn sketch to overload the multiply operator to be dot product because man, you're going to be in a world, world of hurt when you uh, switch between that and HLSL or that and GLSL or whatever, right? Did you add the quick calc hotkey? No, I didn't. I probably should. Uh, Quick calc is pretty cool. Um, what would I use? Uh, I got a. I don't have many keys free, is one problem, right? Uh, so I don't really know. Let's take a look at the .emacs file. Uh, I don't know what keys I have free. Urgh. Um. Let's see here. So, um, yeah, um, 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 um. yeah, maximize frame could probably go away. I don't really use that anymore. Um, I use those fairly frequently. Next, let's I use I menu. 
undo, upcase word I don't really use, nor capitalize word, fill paragraph I do though. Replace in region, start keyboard macros, all important, kill this buffer, always use those, make without asking. Yeah, so I could probably use, lose maximize frame. Uh, so alt P could be quick calc, that is plausible. Um, because that's not really doing anything. So we could do quick calc like so, um, eval region. So we could do that. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and try that. We'll try that out, see how that goes. Let's see how it works. Three plus five equals eight. Well done, Emacs. Is XML fair game in this project? It's not a library, but it still might not be handmade enough. Uh, well, it would be fine if you wanted to like load an XML file by writing the parser yourself. That's certainly handmade, right? Um, I don't know why we would ever want to do that. Uh, but, you know, the, the handmade part just means we write everything with no libraries. So as long as you parse the XML file yourself using your own code with your own parser that you wrote by hand, that would be... Uh, legal by the standards of Handmade Hero. So it looks like we are done with questions. Pretty early, in fact, if I'm not very much mistaken. Yeah. All right. Well, that was good. Oh, looks like we got one more though. Don't you feel that low entities have already too much extraneous stuff in them and it would be time soon to split them and also things like the sword might not need the low part at all? Um, so it's not so much that it, that it wouldn't be reasonable to split it now uh, because there is a fair bit of stuff in there and we can start to think about how we want to do it. My fear is just that we haven't gotten far enough with the types of things that are in there. So what I'd like to see is I want to implement a few more things so that I know that we have like most of the types of stuff we would care about in there. Uh, some examples would be like I'd want to have some property transference. Like I want to be able to have like, like at a minimum, right? I think what we want to have working before we start writing the any system is uh, there's a blue flame in the middle of the screen and if you throw the sword through it, the sword picks up the blue flame property and then when it hits the monster, it does blue flame damage or something, right? At a minimum, we want transference of those sorts of things happening in the entity system before we would start to break it apart. Because if we break it apart now, we'll probably make simplifying assumptions that are wrong because we haven't put enough complexity in there. Uh, so I want at least a, a little more complexity in there. And since we have no reason why we have to break it up now, right? There's nothing, we don't really care about our memory footprint, footprint right now, right? Um, we care about our memory footprint way down the line. And so right now it's way easier to just have everything in that until we get as much stuff in there as we can think of that might be different, like as many disparate things as we can. And then it's time to maybe break it apart and think about it. What will we do at 3 p.m. PST when this game is finished? Um, this game won't be finished for like two years because we only do an hour a day. So I think you really won't have to worry about that for quite some time, right? I mean, we've got a little bit more work to do, a couple more weeks or something on entity stuff that we want to do. Then we've got maybe a week or two on animation, prototyping. Then we got to write the renderer, right? That's going to take several weeks to write the renderer. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to write uh, the entity systems and stuff. That's going to take several weeks. Then we're going to have to write, you know, some sound stuff for some, a couple weeks. You know, we're going to be, it's going to be June and we're only going to be starting on the game code, right? Or something like that. 
Uh, and then there's tons of game to write. We've got to write world gen. We've got to write all the properties that we want. We've got to write AIs for the monsters. I mean, in an hour a night, right? So we are going to be programming this game for a long time, right? It's going to be Christmas, and we're going to have only the basic stuff working. We're going to have, like, you know, very, you know, uh, half or, or less of the game implemented and then it's going to be the next Christmas and we'll have most of them implemented or something like that and then we'll still have to do ship up, shipping versions of the Win32 Linux Mac layers there's a lot of work a lot of work ahead so so buckle up are you happy with the current progress uh, yeah pretty happy actually because um, we've only done so we've done like 62 hours of programming right um, which is less than two full weeks and we've already got, you know, basic stuff working pretty well. Um, so I'm pretty happy with the progress. We'll see how long the renderer takes. I'm, I'm a little nervous about how long the renderer is going to take, but we'll see how we do. Hopefully we do the renderer in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, if, that, if that works out, then I think we're in good shape. But, but it might not. More than memory footprint, I was thinking about unwanted side effects, i.e. code that deals with the transfer of properties ends up triggering hard to debug shenanigans with the positioning, etc. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that things are harder to debug for us now because we don't have any systems in place and we don't have any debugging tools in place either. And so those will be things that we'll get, you know, a little bit further down the line. Uh, but it's okay to suffer through those right now because I think it's, it's not that hard to debug stuff. Like most of the time when I'm debugging stuff, it's a, it's a typo uh, at the moment. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we could do to fix that. So I don't think it's worth it right now to be doing those sorts of things. It's always a tough call to make, but I think it's really not worth it to be doing that now because the work that you'd be doing to split apart low entity is all going to be wasted because it's all going to be wrong if we don't get more stuff in there. Uh, and so doing it to try to eliminate bugs, I think, is a bad trade-off call. That's just my guess. Is that it? Do we have any more on-topic questions? Mm, I do not think so. All right. All right, good deal. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It was a pleasure coding with you as always. Um, if you would like to continue this adventure with me, I will be back here tomorrow at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, same time, same place, right here on Twitch, and I would love it if you could join me. If you want to follow along with the game at home, you can always just pre-order the game, and it comes with a source code, which I update every night. Uh, so you can go ahead and follow the video series and code along with me to your heart's content, um, and, uh, and that's a pretty cool way to learn from the stream if you uh, are trying to learn uh, low-level game programming and stuff like that. Uh, it's a pretty easy way to, to get started, actually. If you are new to the series, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. We have a Patreon you can subscribe to if you want to support us. Uh, that's always uh, very appreciated. Um, and if you're uh, new to the series also and want to know when the, what the broadcast schedule is, we have a little uh, Twitter bot. You can go, basically, handmadehero.org has all the links. You can go to the tweets uh, section, which is basically like a, a little uh, bot that tweets out the schedule every day, um, which is pretty handy. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a great site, the News and Forum site, which I highly recommend checking out. Um, basically, it's got the schedule on the front page. So you can keep track of that. Uh, it's got an episode guide, so you can kind of go through uh, and go through old episodes. So if you want to learn how to set up a dev machine uh, to follow along with the, with the stream, if you want to learn how to program the Windows platform layer, everything that we've done is in here, um, and, uh, and uh, it really makes it much easier to catch up by going through there. We also have a coding resources page, which has some cool stuff. If you're looking to program on a different platform, people in the community have already done ports to it ahead of, like we're gonna be doing that later in the series, but they've already done it. Uh, so if you're trying to follow along on Linux or Mac, that's the place to do it. And then of course, there's our code discussion board where you can ask questions and stuff like that. Um, of, uh, and I answer them and also other people, uh, there are other experienced programmers who hang out on the boards and they answer questions too. So I highly recommend checking that out. If you're trying to learn from the stream, it's a great place to go. So thanks everyone for joining me. I hope to see you uh, back here tomorrow, again, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, right here on Twitch. Uh, so hope to see you back here tomorrow, and uh, have a wonderful Wednesday. Take it easy, everyone.